Hi, this is Mayor Jim Darling, and this is your City of McAllen meeting with the Mayor. We have Dr. Richard Moore with us today from Rio Grande Regional Hospital. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And we understand you're in charge of the emergency department at uh, Rio Grande Regional. Yes, sir. I'm medical director of the ER at Rio Grande Regional and chairman of the Board of Trustees. Well, thank you for being with us today, and um, it's important. We have a lot of questions from our citizens about they, they've been watching TV and getting a lot of different opinions, and so hopefully we can answer some questions and, um, and, and do some better information that's being put out there. Yes, sir. Good. So now uh, we're talking about, uh, they don't call it the uh, coronavirus anymore. It's uh, COVID-19, I guess. It's getting away from some of the satire, I guess, that they had with the name of the virus. So exactly what is that for, for our people at home? Well, what it means for us is that this is a type of virus that no one has seen before, that is, fr from their immune system. And so once this virus gets into people, because no one has immunity to it, um, the virus can get into the cells and overtake the machinery of those cells, and the virus can start reproducing itself, destroying those cells in the process, and uh, become very sick from it. Some people may not have many symptoms. Some people may just have runny nose and fever. Some people may have no symptoms at all. The ones that become very sick can end up with the need for oxygen and need to be in the intensive care unit and possibly even on the mechanical ventilator. I heard the one, is, one symptom was no smell or taste, which is a pretty unique um, symptom, I think. Yes, sir, that that's, could be early on in the illness. Now, if you have no symptoms, you know, the, there is a question on testing. And so I guess if you have it, but you have no symptoms, you're still a carrier and you can infect other people. So if, um, so would, can it be detected if you have no symptoms at all in a test, do you know? Yes, sir, it, it can be. Um, although probably those patients with the symptoms would have a better chance of having it detected on the test. And of course, that's where the social distancing becomes very important because asymptomatic people, people who have no symptoms at all, might potentially infect uh, family members or friends, especially those who are older, over age 60, and uh, those people who may have abnormal immune systems, people who have either had cancer and, and had chemotherapy or are receiving chemotherapy, uh, patients who are taking medicines for their immune system so that their rheumatoid arthritis is better, those patients may be very susceptible to the infection and especially uh, getting the severe complications from the illness. Now, the, the vast majority, my understanding of testing, um, is, is negative, at least um, right now. So a lot of people want to get tested, and, and there's some, uh, there's some um, guidance that if you don't have symptoms, don't come. We're not going to test you. And uh, private labs are a little different, but for sure the public agencies are don't come for testing unless you um, have symptoms. And so that's used as a, um, not so much a diagnostic test for you, but it's used as a government to make sure that they notify or they look for trends where there's hot spots and those kind of things. So if you got symptoms and you don't have any other comorbidities perhaps, you know, and you're not in the age bracket or whatever, um, go home, isolate yourself and get over it and then quarantine yourself. It really is what, what people should do. Yes, sir, agree. Uh, if, if you don't think that you need to be hospitalized, that is if uh, you don't think that you need oxygen and if you're getting by at home uh, with some Tylenol and fluids and uh, some, some cold cough medicine, then it's best to stay home, isolate yourself, uh, especially from older people and people with abnormal immune systems and you'll get better and you won't infect those, those people that you love who may be susceptible to the complications. And you talked about older people. A lot of, a lot of our families, the grandmas, living at home. And so really, um, what is the best way of um, doing the isolating or how, how would you recommend that? Because everybody wants to see grandma and that's not the best thing for her. Well, we, we see a lot of children in our emergency department and it, it's true, a, a lot of them are accompanied by their grandparents or older relatives and there are things that they can do at home, and I, I, I talk about this a lot with, with other illnesses, and uh, children who are able 
uh, should be taught to wash their hands regularly, um, especially before eating, um, especially after they've, they've touched their face or if they've played with their favorite toys. Um, instilling that in them is uh, a good thing lifelong and it protects the grandparents. Uh, surfaces can be cleaned in the home, such as in the bathroom and in the kitchen and the, the children's toys. Um, uh, it's it's uh, always probably good to have a backup plan in case uh, one of the caregivers for the children becomes ill and to have another person uh, step in their place uh, in case um, one of the older people is not able to take care of the children. You know, and if you, had, if you could, one person would be the one who goes to the grocery store, et cetera, and goes out and limit the number of people that go out and then one person that doesn't go out is the one that um, brings the food into the grandparent or the person with um, the comorbidities and, and separate the duties of that so you're less exposure. Yes, sir. That sounds like good advice. Good advice, yeah. You know, I, I was, I was um, thinking about that the other day is when you said that, uh, we're talking to now some of the grocery stores where whole families are coming in and saying, okay, you really don't need to bring the whole family. And I think some of that's I want to get out of the house kind of syndrome. Um, so we're advising people, if you go to the grocery store, just one person needs to go and you don't go every day. If you try to go once a week, probably you don't want to be hoarding, but you want to make sure you have enough food for a couple of days or for sure. So um, what would you advise them? Like, why do you, if you don't take your kids with you to the grocery store, you're exposing them to, to more um, opportunity. I, I think what you said is, is spot on, and that is uh, minimize exposure to the rest of the population. Uh, observe the social distancing, distancing guidance that's been given out and, uh, and, and keep everybody at home safe and infection free. Now, what do you mean by social distancing? How, does it, how is it spread and why is social distancing so important? So the main mode of transmission is large respiratory droplets. That is when, when an infected person coughs or sneezes, large droplets can potentially land on the other person's uh, eyes, nose, or mouth, and they can become infected. So six feet was an, uh, a distance that was arrived at as a, a safe distance so that those large droplets don't land on the, the eyes, nose, and mouth of the other person. There are probably smaller particles that get into the air, and it's unclear how good those, those virus particles are at causing infection in another person. Uh, so that that six feet guidance is, is the one that probably avoids the large particles. And that's, that's human to human one. Now, um, for instance, I was at the airport and people were grabbing a hold of, of the railing going up the escalator. And I told my wife, don't even touch that because thousands of people do it. Is that, can it be caught that way too? It, it can potentially. And there are lots of studies um, about different viruses, uh, particularly uh, with influenza, which is not the same virus, but, but there's a lot of work that's been done studying how long that virus can remain viable uh, and, and can potentially cause an infection on different surfaces. And it ranges from several hours to, to many, many days. So I, I think that's good advice to your wife. Don't touch the rail. Um, and if you do, go wash your hands immediately. Yeah, these are the most dangerous utensils you could have right now for Agree. your hands. You, you know, uh, and the reason this is so dangerous one is like, like you said, there is no vaccination, there, so there's no prophylactic for that, you can't get vaccinated, and there is no cure in the hospital except they can treat the symptoms of, of it but not the virus itself. And so that's a little difference than the normal flu we've had going back probably another 12 years when they had H1N1. So people kind of get lax, say, well, I'll just get a flu shot or whatever. And that's what this makes this one um, different than what we've seen in the last 10, 15 years. Yes, sir. So is there going to be a vaccination for this one? I know that lots of companies are working on that. And hopefully uh, that will be available, perhaps not for this cycle of the illness. Um, but, but, but maybe to protect all of us for the, the next cycle. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Moore. I really appreciate it. It's been very insightful. This has been your meeting with the mayor. Stay healthy, stay at home, wash your hands. Goodbye. Our team, stories that count from people who care.